doing this? Doing this because to decrypt the final ciphertext, which lives in dimension k, I only need to compute an inner product of dimension k vectors. Okay, so uh, remember that the big part of the complexity uh, of the reason why our scheme was not bootstrappable is that the decryption circuit has depth more than log n. I could evaluate less than log n. Okay, so now once I do this transformation, my decryption circuit has depth log k, log of the dimension instead of log n. Now, if k is much smaller than n, I get I get a bootstrappable intuition. Okay, so that's the main idea. Okay, so uh, a bunch of caveats. Uh, what if once I do this, I have to make sure that k is not. This by itself doesn't suffice because if q is large and the error is small and the dimension is small, the scheme becomes insecure. Okay, so uh, when does it become insecure? Turns out that it becomes insecure in exactly the range that we need. Okay, so if k is uh, such that I can uh, do a bootstrapping scheme, then it is in fact insecure. So it seems like we didn't do anything at all. The the key insight uh, is to uh, produce not just the dimension, but both the dimension and the modulus together. Okay, so you start from a ciphertext uh, that lives in uh, n dimensions, modulo q, and I'm going to reduce the dimension of the modulus to k and p. Okay, so p is much smaller than q, k is much smaller than n. Okay, so what I did was, so now I live in uh, mod p, and p is so small that this uh, problem doesn't arise anymore. Okay, so k is bigger than uh, log p, and therefore, you know, I still have security. So this is what I'm learning. It's not dimension reduction, it's actually dimension and modulus reduction. That's what I'm going to do. Okay, again, what we, uh, what we will do is we'll take a, a, a ciphertext, which is an encryption of a message uh, under a secret key, which lives in n dimensions, mod q, converted to uh, dimension k, mod p. Okay, so what are these numbers going to be? n is going to be a lot larger than uh, k. It's going to be a polynomial in k. And p is going to be, uh, remember that q is sub-exponential, right? It's 2 to the n to the epsilon. p, in contrast, is going to be polynomial in n. Okay, so it's going to be much, much smaller than q. In fact, it's uh, exponentially smaller than q, right? Because it depends on your log q. Okay, so we are reducing the dimension by a polynomial amount, and we are reducing the modulus by an exponential amount. That's what we're going to do. Okay. So how do you do this? We do the same thing as before. In the evaluation key, I'm going to publish an encryption of the old secret key, SDFI, each element, using the new secret key S star. Okay. So these green elements live uh, in dimension k, mod p, and the red element lives uh, mod q. Okay. Now this seems to be a bit of a problem, right? Because it seems like we are mixing up apples and oranges here. You have a number which is supposed to live in mod p. You're adding it, adding to it a number that lives mod q. What's, uh, it's not supposed to happen, right? And what, is, uh, what do we do? Well, the solution is very simple. I'm going to translate uh, uh, a number that lives in uh, q, in zq, to a number that lives in zp, simply by multiplying by p over q and round. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. So in other words, instead of encrypting SD of I, which lives, uh, which is a number from 0 to uh, Q, I'm going to encrypt P over Q times SI, which now lives in uh, 0 to P. Okay, so that's, you know, all this or the universes match up, and this is actually a, a kosher encryption of, uh, of SD of I, scale SD of I under S star. Okay, there's a small rounding error here, but it's plus minus 1. Okay, so what did we do? What does this evaluation key do? Uh, let's do the same sort of kind of thinking that we did for linearization. What this guy does it lets, is it lets you write this uh, function of the new secret key, this uh, multiplication of this old secret key by p over q, as a linear function of the new secret key, approximately, right? And because there is a, still an error that we need to contend with. Okay. So, in other words, um, once I have a ciphertext A, B, which is the ciphertext after a bunch of evaluations, 
I am going to um, use this uh, uh, evaluation key uh, to go to a ciphertext A star B star, which is an encryption under uh, the smaller dimension, the secret key that lives in a smaller dimension. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, this, uh, this is easy, right? Because um, we already showed how to go from a quadratic function, a more complicated function, to a linear function using the evaluation key. And now here, all you need to do is go from a linear function to a linear function, right? It's supposed to be easier. It's a, it's a, it's a piece of cake. Right? It's g given what we know uh, so far, it's very easy. Okay. Um, okay. So what did we do so far? Uh, we uh, didn't change the homomorphism depth at all because uh, when you evaluate uh, a function on a ciphertext, it's going to live mod q. So that's all going to happen in the larger dimension and the larger modulus. And once you finish evaluating, you're going to do this one step to convert it to a smaller dimension and smaller modulus. Okay, so the homomorphism depth, it remains the same. What is the decryption depth? So now you have a smaller ciphertext, right? So the decryption depth is this expression, which depends on k and p, which depends on the dimension of the modulus. But now it depends on the smaller dimension and the smaller modulus. Okay, so this is going to be a constant uh, times the maximum of these two numbers, which is uh, order of log k, constant times log k. Okay, so now let's set n, the larger dimension, to be big enough as a function of k, in particular k to the c over epsilon. And once you do that, the decryption depth is smaller than the depth of the functions that you can compute, and that's it. You can uh, you can apply the bootstrapping theorem and you're done. Okay, so this is this gives you a fully homomorphic intuition scale. Okay, dimension reduction. We showed how to translate our linear functions in a larger dimension to a linear function in a smaller dimension and a smaller modulus. No change in evaluation depth. You can do as much as you did before, or the encryption complexity, or the assumption. Um, and that's because uh, the new LWE assumption is actually turns out to be weaker than the uh, LWE assumption in the uh, larger space. And what we did was we decreased the ciphertext size. We went to a smaller dimension modulus, and therefore I decreased the decryption complexity. And that's exactly what gives us bootstrap. Okay, so that's that. Um, okay, so that's a fully homomorphic encryption scheme in its full glory. Okay, uh, how much time do I have? Um, okay, so um, let me now tell you about uh, a couple of applications, a couple of corollaries of our result. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the numbers. We, we actually managed to implement this homomorphic encryption scheme. We didn't use uh, supercomputers, we just used uh, ordinary laptop. And I'll tell you a little bit about the numbers. Okay. Uh, the first application uh, we have is a fully homomorphic identity-based encryption. Um, and the way we uh, build this is uh, as follows. There are really uh, two flavors of uh, LWE-based encryption uh, schemes. The first is uh, uh, what we call the regular uh, style encryption scheme, which is what we described so far. Uh, and the other uh, sort of style of encryption is the dual regular encryption, which I described yesterday. And the nice thing about the dual regular encryption is that you can turn it into an IB. You can sort of build an IB on top of it. The point is that the, the common thing between the regular and the dual regular encryption schemes is that the decryption circuit in both these encryption schemes is a linear function. It's a linear function of the secret key. Okay? So now you can do the same thing as before. You can multiply it to ciphertext. It becomes a quadratic function. You can relinearize. You can do the modulus reduction. Everything goes through precisely the way it should. Okay, uh, so that gives you uh, an identity-based encryption scheme in the uh, random oracle model because you know this encryption, the, the GPV encryption scheme, GPV identity-based encryption scheme is in the random oracle model. But that's not uh, a problem. You have you can apply the same technique to any uh, you know you know tons of uh, tons of identity-based encryption schemes in the standard model based on lattices. You can actually apply this technique to any of these encryption schemes. 
Okay, so that gives you a fully homomorphic uh, identity based encryption scheme. So that's the first application. The second application is, uh, is uh, private information retrieval. Uh, again, as I said before, the problem is that uh, there is a database in the server of uh, n bits, n elements in fact, but uh, let's think of bits. Uh, and uh, the smartphone has an index x uh, in one up to n. It wants to retrieve the x item from the server, from the database. Okay. So how do you do this? You can do this generically using any fully any sort of homomorphic encryption scheme which can evaluate complex enough circuits. So why, how do you do that? Well, um, you can uh, ask the smartphone to encrypt the index, the bits of the index, send it over to the server, and the server you know constructs a circuit which depends on the database. And what does what does the circuit do? It you know simply on input i or input x, it outputs the x element of the database. So you can construct a Boolean circuit which does exactly this. Do the homomorphic evaluation of this Boolean circuit, and what I get is an encryption of the, uh, of the Excel. So you can do this. So you can do this generically from any uh, fully homomorphic encryption. Okay. So this is what, uh, what we do. So what is the communication? Once, once you do this, what is the communication complexity of this process? It is uh, the length of the encryption of X plus the length of the evaluated uh, cipher text. Okay, so that's the amount of bits that uh, that we communicate back and forth. The point is that uh, if you use our fully homomorphic encryption uh, naively uh, to construct this peer protocol, you will have to encrypt each bit of the index separately. Okay, so that's log n times uh, the size of each ciphertext. And the size of each ciphertext is, it really consists of uh, k plus one elements in zp star. Okay, so that's k plus one times log, q, log p bits uh, times log n. Okay, so if you compute the whole thing for an appropriate choice of the security parameter k, this is at least a log squared n bits of communication. Okay. Whereas, if you think of the insecure protocol, if you don't want any security, don't care about it, how many bits do you need to communicate? I just send you an index, log n bits. You send me a bit, one bit, that's that. Okay, log n plus one bits. That's the communication complexity of the insecure protocol. What I want to achieve is a secure protocol. I want to get security for free. Right? I want to get a secure protocol with essentially the same communication complexity. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, the main... Um, a technique uh, to reduce the communication complexity is to do this encryption of the index using a, a, an efficient scheme. Okay, so uh, using a scheme which doesn't encrypt bit by bit, it encrypts sort of you know multiple bits all at once. So use uh, in, in particular use the most efficient symmetric encryption scheme that you know, AES, for example, right? Uh, and what, I, what the client does is it generates a symmetric key uh, for AES. It encrypts uh, the index using the symmetric key. Right? Okay, so this, this is a very efficient encryption. And uh, in a pre-processing phase, in, you know, before I start doing all this uh, computation, I send the server the encryption of the symmetric key using a homomorphic key. Okay? So this is a large communication, okay, because I need to encrypt each bit of the symmetric key separately. But this is a pre-processing phase, okay, this doesn't depend on my index at all. Okay, so this is kind of the same principle that you use in hybrid encryption, right? So you encrypt a key and you use the key to encrypt uh, your actual value. And the second encryption could actually be very efficient. So why does this help, right? The uh, the server gets an AES encryption of, uh, of the index. Okay. An AES encryption, you really can't do anything about it unless, uh, other than uh, decrypting it. Right? So you, the, it doesn't support any homomorphic operations at all. But what the server can do is it can decrypt this ciphertext homomorphically because I have the encryption of the symmetric key. I can run the decryption algorithm homomorphically and I can get, and I can get the encryption of the index x under the homomorphic encryption scheme. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm sending a very efficient but non-homomorphic encryption of the index. And when the server gets it, he can upgrade it uh, to a homomorphic ciphertext. 
Okay? Then he does a whole bunch of operations. It gets a resulting self attacks. And then it applies the dimension reduction operation to convert it to a very small uh, self text again. Okay? So uh, the bottom line is that the self attacks that are sent over this network can all be very small. They are either AES self attacks or very small um, non homomorphic lattice self attacks. Okay? Uh, okay, so what you do again is uh, you get an encryption under the symmetric E of X, you homomorphically decrypt and you get a homomorphic encryption of X, you compute uh, Y, and then you do uh, uh, the dimension reduction. Okay, so the communication complexity of this whole process is the number of bits that you need to encrypt X, which is really log N, right, because you can encrypt log N bits using essentially log N bits of ciphertext plus the length of the ciphertext, which is um, k times log p. Okay, so rather than having k times log p times log n, your complexity is now k times log p plus log n. Okay, so instead of getting log squared n communication complexity, you got more or less log n communication complexity. Okay, so this is really the most efficient private information retrieval protocol that we know of, and it's in fact very close to being optimal. So that's the second application. The, the two techniques that I presented, the, the, the dimension reduction, uh, uh, the, uh, the relinearization technique and the dimension reduction technique are very general. In fact, you can apply this uh, to the ring LWE based system that we developed earlier with Zvika uh, this year. Uh, and also uh, we can go sort of full circle to the beginning of lattice space cryptography. You can uh, apply these techniques to the intro system, to the original intro system as well and make it fully homomorphic. Okay, actually it's like the variant of the other system. Okay, so what we get from these claims is small public keys. The ring-based systems have small public keys and they have uh, very efficient uh, you know, encryption, uh, decryption, key generation algorithms. Okay, that's what we can do. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's homomorphic encryption. The question that, uh, that uh, at least half of you should ask, and practitioners in this uh, audience should ask is, can homomorphic encryption ever be practical? Right? You know, this is a, an asymptotically efficient scheme, but what happens when I plug in actual numbers? Right? So, uh, you know, I don't want to commit myself to a yes or no answer. <laughs> uh, really, at this point, um, the efficiency of these schemes depends on the number of multiplications you want to do, the number of homomorphic multiplications you want to do. Um, uh, the point is that uh, if you want to apply this in practice, you would want to evaluate concrete functions of practical interest, like you know, database choosing an element from the database, right? That kind of functions uh, on encrypted data. Okay, so most of these functions, a lot of these functions, uh, computing the uh, statistics like mean, standard deviation, regression, and so on and so forth, are simple functions. Okay, mean you take, you don't need to do any multiplication at all. Uh, standard deviation, you need to do one multiplication, and you know other functions that, can, that you can compute with a small number of multiplications. Okay, and for these uh, functions of practical interest, uh, the scheme that I presented is likely to be quite efficient. Okay, now, more concretely, we implemented the scheme, uh, not the fully homomorphic encryption scheme, but uh, a homomorphic encryption scheme which can compute. Uh, a small number of multiplications. Uh, think of 10 or 20. By the time you hit 25, we are. Uh, my laptop is, uh, is complaining already. Okay, but, but there are many functions that you can write down with already with such small number of multiplications. Okay, so we implemented this using uh, this magma package, which my code is like a lot. Um, uh, and here are some numbers. Okay, so. Uh, uh, we um, we implement so let's look at the numbers for the scheme which supports one multiplication. Okay, so so this is our system, and this is another system based on uh, pairings, but based on bilinear pairings, which can also support one multiplication. Okay, so fair game. You know we have uh, the same homomorphic capacity. The question is what is the efficiency of uh, these systems? 
Uh, in our scheme, the multiplication takes uh, about 30 milliseconds. Uh, addition is really extremely fast. I mean, you do 100 additions, you don't even notice uh, uh, the time that it's taking. Uh, in contrast, um, uh, an implementation of these sparing-based schemes in the same platform, in using the same software, uh, it's taken order of magnitude uh, more time to do multiplications. Okay, 40 is supposed to, you know, almost 10 times, almost six times uh, as fast, uh, as slow. Okay, additions are, are, are still quite fast. In this case. Okay. My point is that um, um, these homomorphic encryption schemes, they are in their very, very early stages of development. In fact, we uh, did this implementation, and I don't want to say we, my co-authors did this implementation in a couple of days. They just coded up this uh, little program in Magma, and this is the numbers that we got. It's quite likely that uh, if uh, you spend more effort, more hardware, you know, better uh, code on this problem, you will get uh, orders of magnitude improvement and efficiency. In fact, the thing is, the, the, the basic, um, the operation that takes uh, the most time in our implementation is polynomial multiplication. Right. Polynomial multiplication is something that you can do. Um, you, you have uh, tricks based on, uh, let's say, FFT, right, which do very efficient uh, polynomial multiplication. So potentially, there is a lot of scope uh, for improvement in these numbers. How about encryption? Um, so encryption and decryption both take, uh, um, both take about 20 milliseconds in our scheme. It's likely to be faster than, uh, um, let me think about it. Decryption is likely to be slow, but encryption is likely to be faster in the pairing based scheme. Uh, the other uh, caveat, the, the other sort of uh, point of comparison is the length of the keys in these schemes. Right? So their uh, pairing based schemes do better. Right? So the keys are you know, points in an elliptic curve, which is uh, 160 bits, so you know, 320 bits or whatever, two points. Here it's like uh, the, uh, the, uh, the public and the secret keys are about four kilobits in, uh, for this game. That's an order of magnitude more um, than the pairing based schemes, but the multiplication, the operations are very fast. Okay, so uh, we come to the star that I, uh, that I uh, alluded to before. Uh, which is a question of circular security. Okay, so um, what happens? The question is, what happens when we take our uh, scheme and apply the bootstrapping theorem to it? Okay, so what happens is that um, you um, the fully homomorphic encryption scheme that you get has the following property: you tell me the number of multiplications, the maximum number of multiplications that you want to do, it can be any number of your choosing. I don't care. I will give you uh, a scheme which can do that many multiplications. Okay. And that's roughly because in the public key, you still have to publish this chain of interruptions. You still have many secret keys and a chain of interruptions, one for each depth of the circuit. And you can keep going. You can evaluate a circuit, so you can keep going. But once you reach, uh, once you uh, finish evaluating the maximum depth, you're stuck. You can't go further anymore. Okay. So that's a problem with, uh, with our scheme as well. Um, and there are two ways to solve it. One, well, I mean, the, the wimpy way, which is that, uh, you know, let the evaluation key grow with the depth. So in other words, have a maximum number such that this is the, you know, most I can do with the scheme. But, but what if I want to do, you know, what if I want to sort of publish a scheme, publish a public key, and later I decide that I want to do a lot of multiplications. Okay, so how do I handle that? Well, uh, one way to do that is to assume uh, that um, uh, the encryption scheme is circular secure. So what does that mean? Instead of publishing, sort of, instead of having many secret keys and encrypting sort of one secret key with uh, the previous secret key, just encrypt uh, the secret key with itself. Right? Encrypt quadratic functions of the secret key using the same secret key. Okay. So in general, we don't know how to say we don't know how to prove the security of this uh, modification uh, using LWE, but you can make this assumption. I don't know how to break this. Uh, uh, this assumption at all. So, you know, in practice, this is what you might want to do. Okay, uh, but, but but that aside, uh, there is a sort of an interesting sort of uh, theoretical question here, which is, uh, can I get uh, a short evaluation key? In other words, do as many com computation as I, as much computation as I want, 
without this additional circular security assumption. Okay, so that is a, that is an open question. We have some partial progress on this question. Uh, in fact, we can um, encrypt. We can show that using our scheme, it's okay to encrypt um, some functions of the secret key. But what we really need is to be able to encrypt the bits of the secret key, and that we don't know how to how to do. That we don't know how to prove is secure. Okay. So that's uh, that's that. Uh, what we did was uh, we constructed a fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, from the hardness of uh, approximate sharp vectors in arbitrary lattices, no ideals, no squashing, no sparse subset sum assumption. Uh, we have an efficient scheme, uh, an asymptotically efficient scheme, with short ciphertext. The keys are easy to generate. They're not structured at all because uh, you know, it's a random uh, vector in ZQ to the n, right? Uh, the point is that the point I want to make is that you know, uh, if you don't, even if you don't care about homomorphism. The scheme by itself is uh, is efficient enough and nice enough that you should really be thinking about using it in uh, in your applications. I showed a fully homomorphic IP, or at least uh, the idea behind uh, getting one, a private information retrieval protocol, and uh, and that's that. Be uh, good. Uh, no, no, uh, uh, um, no. Uh, what I meant was a scheme uh, where you can encrypt. So th this scheme, same scheme. Um, uh, okay. So what we implemented was a was a ring version of the scheme. Um, so the scheme by itself, it can encrypt only bits, or maybe like uh, ZP elements for some slightly larger uh, P, right? Uh, and that's not particularly efficient. What we did was we implemented a ring variant of the scheme where you can encrypt many bits uh, in a go. Um, so let's say you encrypt, uh, you can encrypt 128 bits uh, in one ciphertext. And when you want to uh, sort of uh, multiply two such ciphertexts, um, you take uh, this much time. Okay, and the multiplication is over, over uh, a ring, Z2 of x mod x to the n plus 1. Thank you.